So good morning everybody and so today we are start to speak about React that will be um, the topic that we will cover for the vast majority of the of the course until the end. Uh, we will speak a little bit uh, about the server, about the backend, but still to be used with React. Uh, so we, we are starting today this, we will dedicate this three hours to getting started with React and basic things about React and then we will continue clearly along the course, we're adding more and more complexity. So the first things you, you have to know about React uh, is not this one here, actually. Uh, this is probably the second things you, you need to know. But the first things you, you need to know about React is that um, React has its own way of working, clearly. So it has some rules, it has some things that it does for a reason, and whether you agree or not with these reasons, using React means that you have to follow, you have to play with the same rules that React has. Mm? So there are things that uh, you have to do mm? because the React works in that way. That's, so that's the first things to keep in mind always. And the second things you have to keep in mind is, uh, is that everything you know about uh, the DOM manipulation, mm? so everything you did last week, basically, uh, is not wrong, but is um, not usable anymore with React. Okay, so everything you did the last week was for your knowledge, but you cannot use it or should not use it anymore if you use React. Because again, React has its own rules and React manipulates the DOM directly and automatically. And we will see how. But it's React that manipulates the DOM. It's not you that manipulated the DOM directly. It's you telling React, please do these changes and React will take care of doing the changes like you did last week. So under the hood, React does exactly the things you, do, you did last week, uh, get elements by D, etc., etc., etc. But you work on a slightly higher abstraction level with React and delegate all these things to React. Hmm? So, this is the first two things you, you have to know. The, the goal here is clearly to learn one of the most popular, right now is still one of the most popular uh, front-end library for the web. Um, in the first slide, I think it's called framework. Uh, do you know the difference between a framework and a library? Any idea? They are the same things, different things, who cares? Yeah. Library is more specific, maybe. Uh, for example, DJS uh, concerns only about the while the uh, bootstrap is a framework. Yeah, exactly. Uh, library, so we, we tend to use them uh, in the same way as synonyms. Uh, we often say libraries of frameworks, doesn't matter. But actually, yes, library is more specific, like DJS, it matters about dates and times and all that is related to them times but not to uh, other measurement system, for instance. And React is a library for creating user interface on the web primarily, not only, uh, but it's for doing that work and try to do that work at the best. Frameworks are more general purpose, can have libraries inside, can have multiple things, Bootstrap can be considered a framework in a way, it's more a toolkit, but yeah, it's, that's the meaning. You can do multiple things with Bootstrap, even not strictly related one to, uh, to the other. So yeah, React is one of the most popular front-end libraries used. There is the, the web version of React, that is the one that we are going to use, it's called React. And there is React Native, that as the name say, allow you to use the same mechanism, the same logic that you will see in this course, but to create native user interface. So user interface that will be ultimately used on a mobile phone 
or on a desktop computer, so native for the operating system, not web-based. But same library, sort of same library, same ideas to be used uh, for also creating this. We will focus on the web part, clearly. So what we are going to see uh, in these lectures are, well, the basic principle, especially today, the architecture of our React application, and what it means to do a React application, because again, React has its own architecture on how things work. And you should follow, again, the architecture that React has, the logic that React has. Again, for instance, you should not do any more any manipulation with the DOM directly, because it's a React job now. And then also programming techniques. Uh, and we will leverage Basically, whatever we have seen up to now, partially excluding the uh, JavaScript in the browser, the DOM manipulation parts, because again, it's a React job now. But everything else that we have seen about JavaScript will be in use here, hmm? because we will use JavaScript for programming with React. Hmm? And we also, in the exercise, we will also reuse some part that you did last time during the, the classes. Um, uh, well, we are using version 18 of React that was released in last year, in June, uh, 18.2. Um, and we have clearly React as a website and uh, a GitHub repository. It shouldn't be um, really uh, something new. Um, and well, the React website is new. The React website is react.dev, is a new website that went online a couple of weeks ago. And also all the documentation is new. They totally rewrite the documentation with respect to the past. And this is one thing with frameworks and libraries that they change, they love to change. So if you uh, listen to the lecture of last year, there will be some, most of the things will be similar, but other things will be different because the library changed. And if you uh, listen, for no reason, to the, to the lecture of three years ago, uh, you will see that we were using uh, components that we are going to, to speak about using classes in JavaScript, but now we are speaking about components using functions because the React evolved over time and we will need to, to keep pace. Instead, everything we have done until last week included is something more stable. It, will be, it was like that three years ago and it will probably be like that five years in the future. These things about React that we're going to see today will be totally different in five years in the future. And it was different three years ago. So this is one of the things about libraries and about framework that they bring with them advantages, but they, are, they can change because they need to evolve to keep pace with the needs of developers, et cetera, et cetera. So why we're using React as a library, or in general, why you should use a library, considering this trade-off um, that clearly it's something that can change in, in the future. Um, so you need to keep pace if you want to continue to use that. Um, so first of all, it, React will allow us to simplify the browser environment. So React provides you with uniform DOM methods. So instead of having a lot of DOM methods, something similar, something old, something new, uh, some behaving some way, other giving you other way, uh, other objects, for instance, in return, uh, React provides a uniform, modern DOM methods. And clearly, you're not manipulating the DOM directly, but through React, you will ultimately change the content of the page through the DOM, because that's the thing that the browser understands, hmm? manipulating the DOM. Uh, there is a hierarchy in how you build the page that is more explicit than the one in um, HTML. Uh, and this is linked to the higher level components that HTML elements. And we are going to reason and build mostly components. And then components that will have inside other components, etc., in a hierarchy. And there is also an automatic processing of events and updates. That is something that React does on its own, and you have to, to know the rules not to have 
um, strange behavior. And it also simplifies, if you keep in mind how things work, the development methods, because there are predefined patterns hmm, as some opinions react on how things should work. And you have to learn the react opinions and follow them. So using patterns is clearly extendable. There are plugins, extensions, things that can build. Uh, and as, as also explicit and rigid state management structure that we are going to mention today, but we will dedicate like one hour just about the state uh, next week. Uh, well, main resources, there are tutorial, there are API references. All of this is new. Hmm? A, a couple of weeks ago, we put it online. So they, they revise entirely the, the documentation. Uh, it's, it's actually clearer than, than in the past. And we also have, uh, and we also need to use browser development tools. Uh, the React developer tools is something that you have to install. Hmm? It's available for Chrome, it's available for Firefox, it is the same plugin, it's the same browser extension that will allow us to uh, explore hmm, React code. So why do we need this and the browser inspector is not enough? Opinions. Yeah, the DOM is changed by React, but we can see the, the results, no? So. Yes, we can look at components instead of HTML. Mm -hmm. So when you run a React application, what React does is clearly uh, translating everything in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, in plain HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Because it's the browser understands these things. The browser understands HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. It doesn't understand components. So what these developer tools does is to put one level higher than the browser inspector that is still available, and you can still use it for inspect HTML, JavaScript, normal JavaScript, and um, uh, CSS, like you did in the past see errors in the console, see warning in the console. That is all things that still work. But these developer tools allow you to have a view on components, on properties on components, before they are translated in the respective HTML page. So you can see the process going on a little bit and not just the result that is updated in the browser. So we are going to use these to understand how things work, especially when things don't work. Um, and so let me add um, three minutes of uh, history and related things. Do you know who created the React? And who is maintaining React? Facebook. Facebook. It's actually Meta, but yeah, Facebook. Um, and why? They use it in Facebook, the social network, yes, exactly. They add a need. This happened for a lot of open source projects from these companies. They add a need, an internal need. Uh, they need a faster way to render pages on Facebook. And they created this library for solving their problem and then it worked and they decided to, to open source and release it. And then a community built on it and it was extended, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is pretty common for uh, many uh, libraries and frameworks that start from companies. Angular is another example in Google, uh, even if they don't use it directly in their product. Uh, but in this case, it's something that stem, up, stem out from uh, what they used for solving a specific need they had, that is having faster, more responsive pages on the social network. And this idea of having faster and more responsive pages on the social network is what we're then going to use for also creating our own uh, applications. That will mostly be, if you remember the slides about um, web architecture, 
it will mostly be um, what's called single page applications that are it was a reading that surely you have read right so Okay, so what, what's, the the, what's the traditional uh, web architecture? You have a server, right? What the server is doing? Set the page. Set the page on a request. Give a page on a request of, of the browser. And this page is? Static, static, HTML, static. An HTML page. Which static or not is, yeah, it's an HTML page. That, who is generating this page? The server. So that's a classic architecture. The browser make a request to the server. The server does things and return an HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript page. And every new request gives a new page. That's the traditional way of working. Hmm? The server side generation of HTML page, a web page. Here we are in a different paradigm, mostly in which we have in React that the browser asks for the server the first page. The server returns the React application to the browser and all the logic for rendering the page and all the subsequent page is done in the browser. So the server provides just the first HTML page and then JavaScript in the browser of the person opening the page does all the work. Hmm? What's to be put in that page, what happens when you click a link, is something that is the browser handling. Hmm? So that's why we don't have a server yet. We start with React and we can create a React application. We, we don't need the full server at the beginning. We will need for data to have persistency of data. But right now, if we have fixed data, fake data, like you had uh, last week, we don't need a server to provide all this information. We just need a server to give us the first page. That is the entire React application. And then it's the browser, each, each browser that independently does the elaboration. So advantages of these two approaches from a computer science perspective. First approach, the server does all the work, the client is really stupid. Just send a request and do a little bit of things, advantages. Less workload on the client. Less workload on the client. And, uh, security Some security concern, probably, yes, maybe. Yeah, you, you have everything in a centralized place that is a server that decides some policy, so you have more control, for sure. And then the, the clients, whatever they are, hmm, how many they are, doesn't matter, just send a request to the server. And, and there is quite a lot of requests going on, hmm, because every client sends every request for every page. So if you have 100 pages and 100 clients, you send 100 per 100 requests overall. That's not a problem for a server, but if you don't have 100, but you have... 1 million on 10 million requests, then it's pages and uh, clients, it becomes slow. Hmm? The React approach, the single page application approach, advantages and disadvantages. Well, we have less requests on the server. We have less, potentially less requests on the server, but Possibly faster response time, but, and disadvantages? Difficult to set up from the, for, for the programmer? Um, difficult to set up from the programmer what? Uh, the, the whole things. The, the whole way, the web app. Um, maybe. It's more that 
Well, depends. Hmm. It cannot be, it's difficult in general, but yeah. Uh, it's more complicated. It's more, it's made of more pieces that can be moved. You don't have more, you don't have any more centralized place where everything happens, but you have more moving pieces. So yeah, that could be one factor. But most importantly, who is doing, doing all the work, most of the work? The client. So every single client is doing the same work for everybody at the same time. So if I have a React application here, it's my browser that is doing the work. And if you run the same React application, it's your browser that is doing the work. So every browser is doing the same work. And so it's more distributed, but it's still on the, on the browser of the people. Yes, that's another thing. So synchronization of information is more complicated. If you need synchronization of, you still need a server somewhere to help you with synchronization. So uh, these are the two extreme. Then what, what happens now is that there is something in the middle, some hybrid things for which some of the work that we are not going to see, uh, for which some of the work is, do, is done in the server, some of the work of rendering web pages done on the server and some work for rendering web page is done on the browser, just to pick, trying to pick the best of the two words. Mm? So he, here we are following more the single page applications. We have the React application, that's something that we are going to start today, that is running entirely on a browser. Mm? And then when we need to synchronize information, when we need to get data, like the list of questions, like a list of answers that are the same for all the application, or login that needs to be done in a centralized way, then we will rely on a server, but not a server for giving us HTML pages, but a server for giving us information, data, raw data. And then it's React that will get this raw data and will decide which data to render, where to put it, which to ignore, etc. It's still the browser to do all the work. Well, not all websites, uh, but uh, there is a, a good quantity of websites, especially the one that, that needs um, high interactivity, like social media, for instance, that use something like React. Maybe not React, maybe Angular or Vue or name one, but yeah, things more similar to React than not the, the classical, let's say, way of operating. Because they are different need. Uh, so a, a newspaper website is significantly different from Instagram, just to name one. Not as content, well, also as content, but uh, about the, okay, let's imagine this. And then we will need to go back to React. Um, let's imagine that you have a newspaper website with 1 million visits per hour. And then you have Instagram with 1 million visits per hour. Hmm? Same visit. Uh, I can tell you that the number of work that Instagram needs to do is much higher than the number of work that the newspaper website has to do. Why? The interactions. The interactions. Also different media was more the interaction. What you can do in a, in a newspaper website? Read. And maybe leave some comments. But mostly is reading, clicking, watching video, but you don't do anything. What you can do on Instagram? Like, share, send messages. Create videos, create, publish photos etc 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 the the role of these million people is very different one million people on the newspaper website reads so open the page and reads and then close the page that's it these same one million people can in the same moment read comments share like create videos 
create uh, post images, create stories, show stories, send messages, reply to messages. It's way more work than for a normal website. And for this kind of website, things like React are more suitable because allow, uh, well, offload some work from the server to the browser, first of all, and then help managing these faster response time, etc. with extra work, clearly, from a developer's perspective, but to make this more faster, faster, but uh, still has benefits for this. And, this and, and exactly there was where this uh, framework and library were born, hmm? to fulfill these needs uh, of, of social networks, basically. Hmm? Okay, is it clear? No. Um, well, it, it depends. Again, it depends. Uh, typically, so let's think about images um, because videos could be slightly different, but images are probably stored in some central places and then sent to the browser like data, right? And then the browser direct application decide again where to show the image if it's proper if it's your own image and then you can edit it or it's another person's image and you don't have the the privilege to to do to do anything on it so uh in this moment we are going to to start having everything react but what happens is that data whatever data is images included is, is in a server in a central place because otherwise if you imagine uh, that you are creating something for sharing images, but you don't have a centralized place, then you have the image, but I don't have the image because I, how can I get the image from your client? I cannot really. So I need to have access to a centralized place uh, for uh, more access to this information, information that can change. And so if you delete an image, I want to see that you deleted an image. So synchronization has uh, we were saying also before and then it's where the server enters in the paradigm but again the, the idea is that the server is more providing data than not providing pages hmm? pages are generated by react that it has its own server but just for this purpose okay but we will see all of the mo most of this during the course okay so design principle and ideas behind React. First of all, uh, React has a functional approach. Do you remember functional programming in JavaScript? That one. Um, so components, so pieces of pages are functions. We will define them as function. And React has also a declarative approach. Hmm? So again, never explicitly manipulate the DOM like we did last, last week with React. And with the declarative approach, we never explicitly define the order of operation of things that needs to re be rendered on the page. We just define how components, how pieces of the page render itself. We say, okay, the nav bar needs to be rendered in this way with this information. And then React does what it needs to be rendered and keep updated. Hmm? So we offload part of the work. We declare what we want. We don't explicit the logic behind that. Hmm? For the presentation part, for the things that we want to see on a browser, on a screen. Uh, for the functional design instead, components are function. React, and this is, important to keep in mind react re render everything on every change that you do on a component hmm? so re render regenerates all the page on any change that uh, you do on a component and this seems really bad for performances 
So you change the color of button and all the components to renders. Also the others that are not the button. That not really makes sense. But actually it's, it's not efficient to rebuild the entire DOM for one single change. So since it's not efficient and, and they thought about it, React introduced a concept that is called the virtual DOM. So another DOM, a virtual DOM, they, stand, they stay on top of the normal DOM and React, first of all, manipulate that and at a certain point it will bring the changes to the actual DOM of the page. And that's why you never have to manipulate directly the DOM because otherwise you skip the virtual DOM and React can change, can rewrite, can overwrite your um, your changes hmm? because React uses the virtual DOM first to render the DOM and if you manipulate directly the DOM you just cut all this process hmm? and the functional design also has an explicit management of the state of the application hmm? that again is something that I mentioned before so every um, component can have two uh, elements that are passed through it, mainly two elements, we will see that there are others, but the first the fundamental one are the state and the props. The props are properties. Hmm? So we will use the name props, but you listen properties. So information that you share between components. Um, and many components don't need a state, just props. So you can also have components with just props. And each component, since it's functional, should be immutable and it important. And so on screen, the component is like that. You cannot change. You can change with the words that are in the component, but not the entire component behavior. Once it's created, you have to create another component. And um, this also means that props, properties. Hmm? So you have a component. So let's say a component's navbar, and maybe inside the component's navbar, you have another component that is a button. And you can have properties on this navbar, the name of the website, um, that you can decide to pass to the children of these components, so let's say this button. Uh, these are, this information, the name of the website, is a property of the components that can be passed to the children, if needed, and they are immutable. So once they are set, they can only be read. The children cannot override that property. So only can be read. The state is not directly mutable. It has its own way to be mutable through special calls. And again, we will see all about state. And functions should be... It's written R poor but let's say should be poor, so they should have no side effects besides computing the return value. And the return value is how the component is rendered on screen. So re-rendering the same components always must always give the same result. If I render the components once and I see one thing so with specific properties, the second time should, should, should appear with the same property, should appear in the same way. And after 100 times, should still appear in the same way if the properties are the same. Mm? So this is something that is given by default mm? to be always considered. Um, and a React application, as, as I was saying, is made by component. Mm? So the navbar component, the table component, etc., etc. Some components are built in. All the HTML elements are available as components by default. So H1, H2, P, etc. are have their own components representation. And components can be built, personalized, customized, created new components hmm, as you want. So you can create a question component, a answer table component whatever you want components that will clearly encapsulate things up to the HTML level, HTML, HTML elements or components that represent HTML elements in the end because the browser needs to understand uh, what, 
what to be rendered. And as I was saying before, the entire React application is re-rendered. So the entire application is re-rendered every time a state change and every time a property change. Again, terribly inefficient if you think about, about it in general, but keep in mind this virtual DOM. Uh, so each component will rebuild itself from scratch, even with minor variation. So clearly this is, as I said before, terrible for performance, and that's why React implements a virtual DOM layer. So there is the DOM, that is the one that you used, and on top of it, React put a virtual DOM. React, like many other uh, framework and libraries similar to React, is not a uh, specificity of React only. So if you use Angular, also Angular has a virtual DOM. So the virtual DOM is an internal data structure that is optimized for having very fast updates. Since by default, every time that you change something, everything is re-rendered, they built a data structure that is efficient for handling this, this frequent operation. And the virtual DOM does more than this. It also corrects some anomalies and asymmetries that exist in the DOM for historical reasons. Uh, it has its own synthetic events. So the events in the browser, the on-click, the on-focus, etc., that you we will use last week and before, uh, have been superseded by their own events, the React events that are synthetic events that are more uh, uniform in, in the way you use it. And then under the hood, clearly it's generating the on-click events, for instance, because the browser still understands only that. And how the virtual DOM is, works, works that after the components re-render, so you change a button, that's trigger a re-render of the entire application. This re-render of the entire application is done on the virtual DOM. And React, once the virtual DOM is stabilized, computes the differences between the actual DOM represented in the page and the content of the virtual DOM. And only the difference are applied to the DOM. So if you change a component and that's re-render everything, but it's just a color on a button, then just the color on the but of the button is moved on the DOM. Everything else, even if it's re-rendered, is not clearly moved to the DOM. And if the change of the color of the button brings with them another change, just two changes, those two changes are at a certain point moved on the real DOM of the browser. Mm? So it's an additional layer that work their own, on their own. And again, for this reason, you never should manipulate directly the DOM with the function that we have seen, because otherwise you just uh, compromise this behavior. If you manipulate directly the DOM and then React decide that the DOMs need to be changed according to some changes to the virtual DOM, React will likely override what you did. And so you have conflicts between what should be in the DOM and what you expect to be in the DOM. So if you use React, you should use direct way, let's say, of doing stuff. So avoiding, for instance, manipulating the DOM directly. And here there is a, a picture of how this virtual DOM is working. Basically, you see, you can have modification on the DOM, but the changes are not uh, moved on the DOM every step. Just at a certain point, they will in batch move to the DOM. So that the DOM stay constant and receive changes only when uh, the application is now consolidated and re-rendered state, when all the changes are uh, applied and the entire application is rendered in that moment the changes can be moved to the actual DOM. Mm -hmm. So the virtual DOM does more modification than the actual DOM in the browser. Uh, well, this is already mentioned. There are events um, that are normalized across the, the browser and that are coupled with events from the DOM. So there is the click events 
that is the synthetic events that represent the click event in the browser. Mm? And there are other events in React that are synthetic events because are events at the virtual DOM level that then will be eventually optionally moved at the DOM level. So if we need to write a very minimal React application, this is, this is it. This is a really minimal the hello world of React. So you, you, you can notice two things. The first one is this is JavaScript. It's plain JavaScript. And in the bare minimum uh, React application, you have one DOM manipulation. That is the only DOM manipulation that React needs, actually. That is this one. And before reading this and understanding what it does, is there something strange? here. If this is plain JavaScript, and it is, there is something strange. Yes, the answer is yes, but what is the thing that is strange? The HTML, the HTML embedded in the render, and why strange? Should be a string. Should be a string. There should be court, court, but they are not. Hmm? But this works. This works. Hmm? So this is uh, what is written here: the React element. This is one thing that we are going to use that is called JSX. Hmm? Uh, so something that is then computed in translated in plain JavaScript, but it represents a component. It's the instance of a component. So a component say H1 is a component. What is H1? H1 is the component that represents the header of first level. And will be rendered in the browser, in the DOM, as an H1, ele H1 HTML element. And the H1 component will accept, probably, a text a content that will be put inside the tag h1 that in this case is a word so all of these the specific text passed to the component is like an instance of the component it's the specific way in which you use that time the component and in, in react jergo this is called the element so this is a react element so the specific instance of a component is called an element and this is JSX, we are going to see it in, the, in a few slides, and so this is valid JavaScript even without the quote, because this is tra translated in plain JavaScript uh, by React. Again, it's one of the things that React does under the hood. So which are the, what React does when it starts? First of all, it defines that in the HTML page, the only page that the browser receives, there should be an element, a tag, with an ID, in this case, that's called root. div id equal root. And this is the container, this is used as the container of the entire React application. So all the entire React application is put inside that container. It's the entry point is the main function in a way. So you have to identify, and this is done by default when you create a React project, you have to identify a root element in which the entire application is mounted, is included in it. Then it creates the root element from the container, and then it renders something within the container. So in this case, we will have a, uh, an HTML page in which we will have a let's say div in the browser we will see a div equal id and within the div we have an h1 hello world so this code will create a M, an html page with a div again id equal root because that's what's reported there and within that div 
and each one a reward. And then the closing tag for the div and nothing else. And all of this is generated, let's say, by these three lines, plus an HTML page that needs to have this root container. And everything that is here will be rendered inside that uh, root element, that root container, that will be the entry point for the entire application. Um, that H1 is JSX, that we are going to use it to write components. Uh, so all of this, that is, doesn't look like JavaScript, it will be it's equivalent to this code. So that h1, hello world, is equivalent to write react.dom.h1, open parenthesis, null, comma, hello world. This is something that React takes care of through some libraries, for instance, Bubble, that will uh, compile let's say, JSX in plain JavaScript. Because again, the browser can only understand plain JavaScript. So this is an extended version of JavaScript, that a superset of JavaScript, but in the end, it needs to be translated in JavaScript. Clearly, this is easier to read and to write than this. You can see that whatever is here is a paragraph and because there is a P and there is a specific text. Here, it's clearly harder if you have a longer program to say, okay, this is a paragraph and this is a text because clearly this is more messy. This is cleaner and it's similar to HTML. But this is not HTML. These are, all of these are elements, React elements, and div, h1, p, etc. are React components that are used as element here. Hmm? Default React components. Again, all the uh, elements in the browser are represented in React components and are written in the same way. Uh, so, as we said before, everything on a page is a component. Component may be nested. Hmm? Um, and th th that three lines create uh, a container in the browser and say that all the components in the React application will go inside that container. So here, uh, how many components do we have here in this page? Imagining that the, the biggest square is just the window of the browser. Eight. Seven, excluding the bigger one, seven. Seven components of which two of them are, let's say, parent component. And the first one, parent component, has within three other components. And the second one has two components in it. And actually, these are probably the same component, just three elements three instances of the block component, one of which of the block post component, one of which has text, the second one is still block post in text, and the third one is a block post that not only have text, but also in image. But it's probably the same block post component, rendered, used in, with three elements. Hmm? Uh, how do you define a component? with a function. So here, there is an example of how you define a component. And typically, you define it with a narrow function, but you can also use a, a normal function if you want. Uh, so you have a component, name, equal, function, and then the return is what should be rendered. There could be another component, could be an element, of another component or could be directly the components that represent the HTML elements. So in this case, this blog post except built directly something out of the HTML, the representation of the HTML element. 
but you can have a blog post excerpt that return another custom build component that will will uh, represent another that will return another custom build component etc etc and a hierarchy until there is a components that will represent in term of div h1 h2 p sections etc so the html element there should be at the end of the chain one component that uses html representation of the html element hmm? and you can pass nothing to the components so you can pass props to the components that can be used for uh, rendering getting information hmm? so here there is some props and this props is an object containing a content that will be i imagine text in this case since we are in a paragraph um, and there are uh, typically logically hmm, two types of component one are the presentational components and one are the container components hmm? so if you remember the picture here the two parents are the container components probably because they just contain other components maybe has some logic behind them and then the others are the representation components that show things on screen so the presentational components generate DOM nodes to be displayed hmm? typically they do not manage the state and may have some internal state but it's only for presentation like changing the color changing the language etc uh, for the specific component the container components instead manage the state of a group of children so think about this if i have these components here these bigger components the parent and this component has a state that say the language if i change the language from english to italian of the bigger component what should happen to the component side they should change the language as well hmm? so and, and this is something that should apply to all the components inside it's not just one hmm? so they the container components maybe doesn't have anything to represent on screen but still have some logic and some behavior for the internal components like a language hmm? uh, etc hmm? and, and still there are components created in this way exactly in this way but just have a different meaning a different behavior uh, the container component are the one that may interact with the backend, with the server providing data, and they surely create the presentational children, the blog post in the picture uh, a few slides ago to uh, display the information that are needed to be displayed. Uh, a few things about props. Props are passed to a component by its parent, hmm? only in a top to bottom data flow. So a props can only be passed from the father to the children, cannot be passed the other way. Hmm? So if the, the components has a props that is language, this props is set here at the higher level, at the higher components, and then the language can be read by the other components, but not going back. Hmm? The data flow is always from the top to the bottom. If you want to change something on the top, you have to pass a callback as a props so that from here you can call a callback, a function defined on the top components and then you can change things. But the change is always at the top level where the props is generated. If the props is generated here, then it will be passed through top to bottom. With props always top to bottom. If you want, a props can have a function in it, can be passed as a function, a function can be passed as a props, and so you can call the function as a callback to manipulate things on the top, hmm? from bottom to top, request. Uh, uh, what is the state? Again, we will uh, cover it more, but the state is just a set of variables local to a specific component that can be initialized or not by some props and can be mutated in specific way and keep in mind this specific way and this specific way are asynchronous 
and they will initiate a re-rendering of the, of the virtual DOM. Mm -hmm. And the value of the state can be passed from one element to the other, one component to the other, through props. Mm -hmm. So the state cannot propagate directly, only through props. And the only data flow that you have in React is this one. Mm -hmm. Especially when you have state. You have the view, You have something in the view, a button, etc. You do something in the view, and this generates an action. I click on a button, I do something, and this action may generate a change of state. I insert in the view, I have an input field, I insert a tree in the input field, I press submit. This generates a non click action on a on submit action, and these three will maybe generate the state according to the logic if tree is, is in the state or it needs to, to change the state. And this change of state will trigger a re-render, so will regenerate the view. And this is the only data flow that you have with state. You start from a view, go to an action and change the state. And the state change the view, optionally. So all these things a view can change an action, an action can change the state, and a state can change the view. Surely trigger a re-render of the view. But you cannot directly change the state from a view without an action. And you cannot re-render a view without passing from the state. Etc. So this is the only data flow that is possible in React. So props are passed top to bottom with callback that can change things and state works in this way, only in this way. It's an action that changes the state, that changes the view, that can generate an action, etc. Uh, as a corollary all of this is that the state is always owned by one component. So it's important to decide where to put the state, and we will. Uh, changing the state of a component will never affect the parents of this component, only the children only the elements that are inside the components that can receive the state, but not the parents or the siblings. And for this reason, again, often the state is moved up to the most common component so that it can be shared with the components that need to access it. So as, as a, an example before, here, if we need to have a language as a state, where we're going to put it? The, the state language. Yes, what is the root? The external square, like this one. Why? Because clearly, if I change the language, I need to change the language here, 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 and here. And if I put the state here, I can only change the language for the blog post, but not for the about and the links, because they are not affected by a change of state of this internal component, because that's a sibling. It's not a children of this. So in this case, if we imagine to have a state that represents the language, we will need to put it on the most general components that we have, because in this case, the language is something that will affect the entire website. But there are options in which it makes sense to have, for instance, a, a state here. If it's something that's just related to the blog post, the order, the length of a blog post. I only want to show blog posts of this month, for instance. This does make sense to have a state about that if this could be a state at the top level because it's just re related not to the about, to the links, but just to this three element here. So it makes sense to be in the container of the blog post. So this need a uh, des uh, design choice or where the states need to be. And we will, again, we will reflect a little bit when we speak more about the state. So uh, what is the first React application? So uh, these are the steps. Hmm? So first of all, we will need to create a project, import the React library. We need to install the dependencies for use JSX. We need to have a, a web server a web server to be able to use modules. 
Mm? So the ones that in Node.js we said require mm, are modules and we want to import and export things between files. Uh, and this is possible in, uh, thanks to a web server in the browser and thanks to the type equal modules in the root script in the HTML page. And then we need to implement polyfill and maybe we would like also to have something that when we save the code, the page will be refreshed, not to manually refresh, etc. So all these requirements, we are not going to do this manually, but there are tools that create a React project from scratch for us with all these needs uh, satisfied, with all the dependencies that we need. And uh, we are going to use this year um, this way of generating a React application using Vite. Hmm? Vite is another JavaScript library hmm? that does various things, including generating React applications so that you can work in React. So what we're going to do is to use an NPM with this command is create, not install. And we will say npm create vite at latest to get the latest version of everything and then set a name for our React application, whatever the name. Then it will appear a menu in which you can choose React or other li libraries, but in our case React, and then JavaScript plus SWC. And SWC is a, um, let's say, compiler from JavaScript uh, written in Rust that it's used for performance reason by Byte. Um, then you can then wait a little bit. It will generate in a folder called my app or whatever you're using here, the React application. Then you can do npm install to install all the dependency from packages.json, including React. Wait a little bit. Um, in this case, 60, 65 megabytes later. You have the entire React application ready, the Scratch React application ready, and you can run it with npm run dev. And at that point, you can open a web browser to the localhost with port 5173 and see the default base React application that will be slightly more complex than the tree line that I show you. It will be just a little bit structured and it will be structured like this. So it will have uh, Package of JSON, we already know this too. Uh, git ignore for anything not to be put on, on Git. Uh, and then some default config of, of byte that we, we don't need to, to check. Then we'll have an index.html that we typically don't touch. It's the default things. That's the one that defines the root element, the root container where the React application is going to build, hmm, to mount everything. This loads the main JSX, that is a JavaScript file that will contain JSX code, that can contain JSX code, and that's why it has the extension JSX, that is mandatory exception, uh, extension, otherwise not working. That is just the main React application, the basic things, uh, the three lines that we have seen a few slides ago, and this main.jsx mount up dot jsx and we are going to start working in app always in app dot jsx app dot jsx is our it's really our react application where we can define components and when we can import components etc and then all of these are some css file so index css is the CSX for the main app css is the css for uh, app dot jsx etc you can have uh, assets, you can have images, etc, etc, a logo, and so on. And all of these in the, is inside an SRC um, folder. So when we launch with npm run dev, this application, this is built by Byte and sent to server, to the browser, Mm, that will visit localhost 5173 and we will see the HTML page 
created starting from the React application. And last things before uh, doing a break, uh, we are going to use um, importing and exporting. So we have seen that in Node, we can import things with require. In the browser, when it's hosted by a server, and when the first JavaScript file is imported in HTML with type equal module, we can use the modules. So in our JavaScript file, we can say import something and export something. And there are various ways of importing and exporting things, including the name export, so a file, export, let's say a variable with a value, but also a variable or a function, etc. And when you want to import, you write import the name of the variable that you define in the export from the file in which you, you want to get it. There is a default export that could be just one export per file, just the default one, in which you export something by default. You can import it in other way. Then there is the rename. Uh, if you want to change the name on the export or the one that we are going to use uh, often is the export list in which we have a series name one name two name three etc of uh, objects or function or whatever they are and want to export them mm -hmm. but export them and then we can import them in another file using the same names that we have used for exporting them mm -hmm. so these are the three uh, main, except the rename, uh, that is still a name import, it's there are the three main way to export things, the default export, the name export, and the list, let's say, export for importing and exporting things. And we are going to use this for importing and exporting, that is more, uh, let's say, natural than required. But uh, in, from a theoretical, conceptual things, is the same than the require that we use in Node.js. But here we cannot use require. It's well, require is only for Node. Here we use the modules that are ECMAScript standard, by the way, that at a certain point will probably be used by default also in Node, but not yet. Okay, then the L word we can see uh, in, in the example. Oh, let me just say one thing. Uh, so I said that React has various extensions, and one of these is, for instance, uh, called React Bootstrap. React Bootstrap is a React extension that gives you Bootstrap in a component-based way. Hmm? So the row, the columns, the container, etc., with React Bootstrap are components that you can use. Build components from, from the maintainer of this library that you can use. Hmm? So we can, for instance, so here you see, this is JSX again, this is the container. This is the equivalent of writing div class equal container. Mm? And row is the equivalent of writing div class row, etc. So the main elements, layout elements of Bootstrap are through the React Bootstrap library available as components, as React components to be used. Mm? So we are going to use it and our two things to be installed, the React Bootstrap and the actual bootstrap library uh, for which it depends. Uh, one more thing, really. Uh, notice one, one thing only, that components defined by you or by anybody are written with a capital letter like a construction function, even if they're not. So by default, the components are written with a capital letter. The only components that are not written with a capital letter are the one that represent the HTML elements. All the other components have a capital letter. So when we define a components, we will define it with a capital letter. And again, the only one that doesn't have the capital letter are div, p, main, ba not body, a section, Etc. Uh, Etc. Et the one that represents the HTML element. When we have to put uh, component into our uh, JSX, we must wrap it in brackets like uh, H1, for instance. 
you have to put it in a bracket like oh you mean li like like these huh? yes when you want to use a component so see here this is a button component that is self-defined whatever it does doesn't matter and when you want to use it it's just uh, using like a an HTML like a tag yes not an HTML tag because it's not but yeah like a tag when you want to use the element the instance of the component you use it in JSX like a tag like a normal tag okay but we we, we will do an example in the next hour after 15 minutes break <laughs>